So thank you very much. I'm very happy to present my uh, research here about palliative sedation and opioids at the end of life. Uh, in this presentation, I actually would like to discuss how issues related to Islamic bioethics uh, may emerge in medical practice in the Dutch context. Uh, I would like to make a short note on the use of uh, Muslim patients. I think in the abstract I mentioned Moroccan patients. That is because in this research I focused mainly on Moroccan patients because the paper will be published in a book on uh, migrants of North Africa. But we see these issues among other um, uh, Muslim communities with different ethnic backgrounds as well. So this will be the content of my presentation. First, I would like to give a short introduction about pain control and palliative care in general. And then I would like to discuss one case in which uh, palliative sedation is negotiated with the physician and with, an, with a patient and an imam. And then I would like to elaborate on these three different perspectives and how they think about palliative sedation and why and what uh, dilemmas it may uh, give rise to. And then I would like to uh, conclude with some concluding remarks. So, um, palliative care has been rapidly developed in Western countries in the past few decades. And um, care in this stage uh, is not uh, actually focused, the treatments are not focused on curing a patient, uh, but merely on improving the quality of life of patients. So there's actually a shift from cure to care in this stage. And pain control is a very important part of palliative care because it can influence the quality of life of patients. So there's a lot of attention to pain control and relieve suffering. And usually we actually see that the pain ladder of the World Health Organization is being used in order to control pain. And the lowest level of um, this pain ladder consists of uh, medications such as aspirin or paracetamol, while the highest stair consists of opioids such as morphine. However, at the end of life, when suffering becomes unbearable, and um, a patient has a life expectancy of less than two weeks, also palliative sedation can be applied, which is defined as the intentional lowering uh, of a patient's consciousness in order to relieve suffering. So a patient will, remi will remain unconscious until death. However, it is not uncontroversial, palliative sedation, because there are a lot of discussions whether it, um, there's actually a very thin line between alleviating suffering on one hand and a life-shortening effect on the other hand of the, such medication. So what we actually see in Dutch healthcare is that the principle of double effect is being used. It's a um, principle that is derived from the Christ Christian tradition, and it makes a distinction between an intended effect and an unintended effect. The intended effect is to relieve the suffering of patients, while the unintended effect is, uh, well, might be a life-shortening effect. So when weighing such a dilemma, this principle is usually used, and the intention of the physician plays a crucial role in this. And uh, when, the in when the intention of the physician is to relieve suffering, such an act is not being seen as morally wrong. So we see in the Netherlands that there was a lot of discussion about the life shortening, the possibly life shortening effect of palliative sedation. And in 2005, the Royal Dutch Medical Association uh, provided uh, drafted guidelines on palliative sedation in which it was stressed that it does not have a life shortening effect. And uh, other issues that were discussed in the guidelines were the procedures, the decision-making process, the conditions on which palliative sedation should be applied. And also the medication that should be used in order to, to reduce a person's consciousness. In 2009, we also see that European guidelines were drafted. And they're actually quite similar to the Dutch guidelines 
although the European gu guidelines do mention a possible life-shortening effect for certain individuals. So both guidelines actually mention that uh, sedatives should be used in order to reduce a person's consciousness and not opioids. So um, uh, relieving suffering is, uh, or the, the, in the lowering of a person's consciousness is being done by sedatives. And this may happen in combination with opioids if they were already used beforehand. But it is not being done through opioids. So in the Netherlands, we have a Muslim minority population of almost 6%. And they usually are from a Turkish background. That's actually the largest uh, Muslim minority in the Netherlands. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, people from a Ro Moroccan background. That's 31%. And they encounter these kinds of issues in healthcare. And what I did in my article is that I analyzed three cases uh, in which palliative sedation or opioid use at the end of life was found problematic by patients or family members. And these cases were published, published in widely read medical journals by physicians because they encountered a dilemma in delivering care. So what I actually did is I analyzed how uh, the use of palliative sedation and opioid use at the end of life was negotiated in this context. So I would like to discuss one case. I cannot discuss them all, all three of them because of the time. But uh, a Moroccan woman of 26 years old suffered from unbearable pain due to a spinal bone tumor. She begged the medical staff to do something about the pain, but she did not ask for palliative sedation or other end-of-life care decisions such as euthanasia. Because the medical team thought that it had something to do with her Islamic background, they consulted an imam to ask the Islamic point of view regarding palliative sedation. Well, the imam did not immediately know the answer, so he consulted other imams. And then afterwards, he came back to the physician and said that it is possible to sedate uh, the patient as long as she's able to perform the five daily prayers. So this actually means that she could not be unconscious for a very long time because every time she needs uh, to wake up for the prayers. So then after discussion with the physician, a solution was found and she was only sedated in the morning so that nursing care could be delivered without pain. Well, in all the cases, from the patient's perspectives, most problems regarding palliative sedation had to do with the Islamic rituals, the performance of the Islamic rituals. And the two important are the declaration of faith, the shahada, which is actually uttered uh, or whispered in the uh, ear of a newborn at the beginning of life. And it, it, it is also strived for that these words are uttered uh, at the end of life, uh, making the life cycle complete. And another ritual that was considered very co important is uh, the ritual prayer. So that is uh, a bit in conflict with, conflict with being unconscious. Another point that, um, that appeared from the cases were visions regarding pain and suffering. So many patients want, and family members wanted that the patient um, to endure suffering consciously. So. Um, Several prophetic traditions indicate that any manifestation of pain can lead to the expiation of sin, but at the same time we also see in the religious text that suffering is not being exalted. So the Quran, for example, indicates that it was not revealed as to be a distress and that no one will be burdened except with that within its capacity. Thus religious texts encourage believers to endure pain, but they also encourage alleviating suffering. So actually, when we are looking at uh, fatawa or religious opinions regarding palliative sedation and opioid use at the end of life, we actually see uh, that the focus is much less on the rituals, but more on uh, the acceleration of death. Does it accelerate death or not? 
And we see, for example, that the European Council for Fatwa and Research issued a fatwa in 2003 on euthanasia in Sweden. And in this context, palliative sedation was also being discussed. And they made actually a discussion between several types of euthanasia, passive, active, indirect. And palliative sedation was seen as an indirect form of euthanasia. And when there is a small chance that it may accelerate death, it is similar to euthanasia, so they actually forbid the practice. On the other hand, we see that the International Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences in Kuwait, they uh, actually approved um, palliative sedation on the, on the basis of the principle of the double effect. So they uh, stressed actually the intention of the physician. If this is um, relieving a patient's suffering, then it is approved even if there is a possible life-shortening effect. However, I would like to note that these fatwas do not, um, they were actually um, issued before guidelines on palliative sedation, and they also do, for example, not uh, make a distinction whether sed sedatives should be used or opioids. So um, it sometimes seems as if they actually um, refer to opioids instead of sedatives because they are talking about very high doses that could uh, result in death, and they use actually very general terms for medications such as dewa or musekkanet, which are uh, not very specific terms for uh, sedatives or opioids. So from a physician perspective, uh, they actually found that uh, these visions of the patient, that they conflicted with their professional standards because they were educated to relieve suffering of a patient at the end of life. Uh, it also appeared that they were uh, not aware of the patient's cultural and religious views on these issues. So they didn't, uh, they actually at the last moment they uh, encountered these difficulties and they could not uh, see that beforehand. And they also found it very difficult that a solution for these conflicts were actually uh, found outside the medical setting by, for example, consulting an imam who does not have a lot of medical knowledge. And one, the physician of the case I discussed described it as follows. He said it would be a life of several episodes each day of inhuman suffering for the woman who was only uh, sed sedated in the morning. So in all the cases I studied, also an intermediary was being used in order to bridge these uh, divergent opinions regarding palliative sedation. So in the case I discussed, we see that it was an imam. We see in the Netherlands, and I think that it applies for most Western countries, that imam play a much broader role in society than in the countries of origin of Muslims. So they have to deal with many difficult issues in which they are actually not trained and uh, usually they are lacking medical knowledge. In other cases, we also see that a healthcare consultant was being used. Um, healthcare consultants in the Netherlands are appointed by hospitals to bridge cultural and practical gaps between physician and patient, more on the practical level than on the ethical level. And we also see that since 2008, uh, more and more Muslim spiritual counselors or chaplains are being appointed. Uh, there is only education for them, like official uh, academic training since 2008. But still, not every hospital has a Muslim uh, spiritual counselor. So I would like to conclude with the following uh, remarks. We actually see that um, in the case, from the cases, is, it appeared that many valued actually dying with a clear mind in order to be able to perform the rituals. And we also see that actually the role of religion in these cases gives actually rise to a triangular process of decision making, which, which is actually different from the ideal of shared decision making between patient and physician. And uh, we, these cases also stress that it is very important to adapt palliative care to the needs of distinct groups of patients. And what physicians can do in such a situation is actually learn more about patients' convictions so that things can be discussed beforehand and that there is a kind of advanced care planning. And. Um, they could also make more use of professional intermediaries in order to bridge these gaps and find a middle way in uh, 
in case of divergent opinions regarding good care. So with this, I would like to conclude.